Good evening, everybody. Uh, this is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and we're here with another of our virtual events. And I'm really excited and, uh, and honored to have uh, S.A. Cosby, a.k.a. Sean, here uh, we, to talk, discuss his uh, really remarkable new book, Razorblade Tears. And, uh, and also to congratulate Sean, I was talking to him a little bit before, on the uh, well-deserved success of this book right here, Blacktop Wasteland. Um, congratulations, man. You've had a great year. <laughs> oh, man. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you to uh, Poison Pen for having me again. It's a pleasure. Yeah, it's been, uh, I, I said earlier, I think when you, when you look at it, I, I don't think as a writer you could ask for anything more. It's been an incredibly gratifying and, and surreal experience, and I'm just so, so grateful. Yeah. And, um, and so this book, uh, the brand new book, Razorblade Tears, I should say to everybody, um, Sean very kindly signed a whole bunch of them for us here at the Poison Pen. And I'm kind of flying solo tonight. So I'll try to figure out how to put the link in the comments field. But um, if you just go to store.poisonpen.com or just poisonpen.com, it's front and center on our website. And it's a terrific book. So pick up a signed copy before they disappear. Um, but uh, boy, just to kind of get into a discussion of this book, there's so much going on here. There's so much to discuss. But I, uh, let's start with talking about Rolling Thunder. <laughs> I, saw, I saw on Facebook uh, somewhere that you had posted uh, Rolling Thunder. And I was like, oh, yeah. You know, this buddy film from the mid-70s, wasn't it? I just remember the, yeah, guy, yeah, I remember uh, the guy with the hook. Yeah, William Devane uh, plays a former Vietnam vet who returns home after being a POW. And his family, you know, is tragically murdered because some uh, bad guys want to take uh, the town. The town gave him a gift of like five thousand dollars in gold or uh, silver coins. And these bad guys come and they want the money and he, you know, won't give it up. And so they kill his wife and his son and uh, and they cut off his hand. And uh, and so he, you know, uses his desire for revenge to push himself on this mission of uh, retribution and uh that was a huge influence on raised blade tears not so much in context but in theme i mean you know of course my main characters raised blade are very different from the character in uh in, in rolling thunder and, oh a little trivia note by rolling thunder i you could somebody can correct me on this but i think it's it's tommy lee jones is either his first or second on-screen role um, I know he looks incredibly young in it. He plays a William Devane's best friend, uh, uh, former uh, 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 you know fellow soldier who who joins him on this mission of revenge. And um, but the thing that struck me that, that that really inspired me that was such a motivation for Blacktop Wasteland was there's this sense when you watch that movie that William Devane's character doesn't care if he lives or dies as long as he takes the people who killed his family with him. There's this, this almost existential uh, 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 resignation to uh, the fact that I'm on a path, I'm, I've started a ball rolling, rolling thunder, that um, it, you know, it's gonna destroy everything in its path and I don't care as long as the people who hurt the people I love uh, get what's due to them. And I really took that ethos with, uh, with Raise Away Tears. Uh, I really took that idea and, and, and kind of inform my two main characters with it. Yeah, it's funny, you hear, you hear that, that sort of uh, sentiment from, you know, various Vietnam combat vets, you know, who, you know, I'm thinking of uh, Ken Anderson wrote a really great book called Night Dogs, mm -hmm. uh, various Vietnam vets. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah and they just said, hey, I just accepted the fact that I'm gonna die over here, you know? Uh, and then mm -hmm, somehow, mm -hmm, somehow they make mm -hmm. it out, you know. Um, and there is, I think, right. And so, go ahead. I, I'll just say, like, I was just gonna say for the two main characters, and I'll, I'll talk about who they are in a second. They both experienced, like, they're not either one of them are soldiers, but they've experienced extreme violence in their life, both violence that they've needed out and violence that they've been the recipients of. Um, they're both ex-cons, and so they both have that sort of um, thousand yard stare. Uh, and they also both thought they kind of put it behind them. 
And so that definitely informed their attitudes in the book. Um, I guess I'll give a elevator pitch about the book real quick. So basically, Raised by Tears is about these two fathers, one black, one white, both ex-cons, whose uh, married gay sons are murdered. And so these two men uh, decide, these two men of violence, decide to investigate the crime uh, once the police investigation seems to stall. And so they're trying to find vengeance for their sons, but also they're seeking redemption for themselves because neither one of them accepted their son's sexuality and accepted their sons for who they were when they were alive. And so to go back to my first point, yeah, this idea of, you know, once they commit to it, once they commit to the idea of like, we're going to, you know, do whatever it takes to get these people, yeah, it becomes this sort of like just rolling ball of 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 angst and and rage, and you know it and it has a lot of unforeseen complications and and consequences. And so, a movie like Rolling Thunder was like I say, like a kind of a a, a spiritual godfather to this book because what does that look like? You know, what is the price of vengeance, and how much are you willing to pay? You know, when is it worth it, or when is it not worth it? You know, is there a point where you beg off or do you see it through to the end? And so that was one of the questions that I was kind of talking about with the book. You know, it's funny reading the book and I got to say it was, um, there, there's something about it. There, there's some real, almost classical illusions or setups in here, at least that I responded to. Um, you know, you got these two guys and they, and they have, what's remarkable about it is that they have this dialogue this running dialogue between the two of them throughout the book. And, uh, you know, they get into some real heavy material. Uh, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, did you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Um, so basically, I used, I, I used my geography. I, for anybody who doesn't know, the book is set in southeastern Virginia. I'm a southeastern Virginia native. And so I live out in the rural, the, the more rural area of the state. And so a lot of times, where when you have to go somewhere, it takes you 30 minutes, 25 minutes, 45 minutes to get there. Everything's far away. And so what I did was I wanted to have these conversations, but I wanted them to be organic. And so I just put Buddy Lee and Ike in a truck or a car, and I forced them to be in a confined space for a long period of time. And they naturally, hopefully, see, it, I hope they came across like that. They naturally started talking, you know, and, and a lot of times they're talking about, like you said, serious issues. They're talking about race and class and homophobia and uh, what it means to be, you know, a man and, and what is the definition of masculinity. And also they talk a lot about regret and grief yeah. and the mistakes of the past. And so by forcing them to talk, you know, their early conversations are very tense, but toward the end of the book, they've come to a mutual understanding and a mutual respect. And they're able to be honest with each other in a way I don't think they've ever been with anybody else. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and some of those conversations I thought were, for me, the my favorite parts of the book really were when they, you know, because uh, Buddy Lee, the, the the kind of the white character um, who is, you know, he drops these just kind of casually racist comments, you know, and uh, right, right. Yeah. And Ike calls him on it and they get into some real interesting back and forth, you know, challenging each other. Yeah. Uh, I thought what was interesting about it is like, I, I grew up around a lot of people like Buddy Lee. Like if you ask them straight up, they'd be like, I'm not racist, but they would then also quote some weird uh, arcane stereotype about African-Americans or indigenous people. And they wouldn't understand that that is A, offensive, B, not true. So they don't have a really good understanding of themselves. Conversely though, Buddy Lee is able to really challenge Ike about his attitudes about fatherhood and and, and his attitudes about his son. You know, both these fathers didn't accept their son's sexuality, but Buddy Lee has come to a place where he's really regretting it. And, 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 I, and he really regretted it before his son passed away. Whereas Ike was very stoic about it. And just, Ike had this fantasy. And I, I kind of, I do a long uh, piece in the first, second chapter where Ike details this inner monologue, this very deep fantasy he had of, you know, eventually, one day with enough time, he and, um, he and Isaiah would have a mutual uh, meeting of the minds that they would meet in the middle. He describes it as this, you know, that they were both on each side of this huge glacier. 
you know, this cold, forbidding space. And that one day they would they would walk across, you know, instead of waiting for the glacier to melt, they should have walked across and met each other in the middle. And the, even that is sort of Ike not being honest with himself because it's not Isaiah's uh, 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 burden to meet Ike in the middle. You know, Ike should accept his son for who he is. And so Buddy Lee kind of challenges Ike on that, you know. Yeah, I'm who I am. He'll say, I'm trash. I'm a redneck or what have you. He said, but, you know, don't hurt yourself falling off that high horse, Ike. You know, so they right. definitely challenge each other. And I wanted to do that. You know, at the same time, Ike is very upfront with Buddy Lee about the disparity in their positions in their community because he's Black and because Buddy Lee is white. You know, on the outside looking in, Ike is what you would call a successful person. He's come out of prison, has gotten in trouble for like 15 years. He's built up this pretty thriving landscaping business. Uh, mm -hmm. He's got a nice little house and a little cul-de-sac in town. Um, you know, he's got a nice, as we call it out this way, he's got a nice big old dually truck. His wife's got a nice little car. You know, he's doing okay. Whereas Buddy Lee lives in a mobile home park and a single wide trailer, and he's barely paying the rent on that. And so Buddy Lee looks at Ike and it's like, hey man, I'm struggling over here. And, and Ike tells him, yeah, but you don't get pulled over three or four times a month. You know, you don't get uh, side-eyed when you go in a nice store or a nice restaurant. And so for me as a writer, uh, I wanted to have these very common, uh, these very, very difficult conversations because I think they're important. Uh, I'm a Southerner, uh, you know, the South is my heart and my home. And I think in many ways, the South can be a microcosm for the rest of the country um, because of the horror of our history and also because of the incredible righteousness of our, uh, our reclamations in some places. And so I thought these two men having these conversations and seeing where they're different and seeing where they're alike is something that does not happen hardly enough in, in the real world. Well, I wanted to ask you because, uh, you know, in a lesser writer's hands, I was really, I really admire the way, you know, um, the way you pulled all this off and you did it in such an organic way by letting your characters do it, by letting your characters talk. Um, you know, did you have, uh, I mean, there's a story here, you know, this is, this is a story, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm sure we've both come across books in which uh, it's clear that people are trying to write about these heavy issues and it comes across right, yeah, really yeah. forced, you know, it's like, well, Bob, mm -hmm. let me tell you about the, you know, the, you know, um, <laughs> these real awkward kind yeah. of. Yeah, I tried. How did you do it? I, I tried really hard. I tried really hard not to do that. And the way for me that worked for me was, and this sounds weird, so just bear with me. I read my dialogue out loud to myself a lot. Like when I would have these guys talking to each other, I'd read the Buddy Lee part, and I'd read the Ike part. And then I'd read back and forth because I wanted to, you know, uh, tonally, like I wanted to get the right syntax and you know, I wanted the rhythm of the dialogue to be good. But also, I guess, narratively, I didn't want to be hitting anybody over the head with a hammer. You know, nobody wants a 300 page sermon, regardless of the veracity of your argument. And so, you know, I've read books like that. You know, I've read books where it's, like, it's very obvious, whatever your position is, that you're really hammering home this message, you know, in Greek neon lights. And um, my thing was, I, I read an article one time um, with Stephen King, and he had this quote where he said, you know, uh, he was talking about his, his goals as a writer, and, you know, he was talking about how he wants to horrify you, and if he can't horrify you, he wants to terrify you, if he can't terrify you, he wants to gross you out. And then he also talked about messaging. He said, you know, I want to write about a message. I want to talk about things that are important to me. He said, but nobody cares about your message if your story isn't strong. You know, your story has to be interesting. And so for me, the thing that I try to do to make the story interesting is give you these two, you know, opposite a track, well, not opposite a track, but these two very polar opposite characters who actually have more in common than they think. And then putting them in increasingly dangerous situations where they're forced to rely on each other. Mm -hmm. um, and so that creates this sort of, uh, uh, sort of bond that can only exist, you know, like uh, there's no atheist in a foxhole, you know, there's no racist right. in a shootout. And so there's this idea that they're forced to be together and that helps to move the story along. And so then it's almost like a magic trick. It's like, yeah, we'll move the story along, but guess what? I'm talking to you about, you know, 
racism here and homophobia here and tragic masculinity here. And, uh, you know, I'm talking about all these things there and, and poverty a little bit and what it means to be successful. And so, um, I don't know. I mean, that was just the way I tried to do it. And I, I learned that or I stole that from other great writers that I admire. Uh, you know, uh, Dennis Lehane was really good, is really good at doing yeah. that. Uh, yeah. I think um, uh, the late uh, uh, William Gay was mm. really good at doing that. Uh, there's a guy, uh, a book I read a long time ago uh, uh, by a guy out of Texas named Clay Reynolds, a book called Agatite. Well, I might be pronouncing that wrong. Uh, but it's a book called Agatite about a small town in Texas and there's a murder. And and uh, I really took a lot from that, like just the way you can talk about things by having your characters talk about it so it doesn't seem very heavy. And, oh, and, oh, and this is just a technical thing. Don't have your characters monologue too much. You know, if your character talks for more than a paragraph, you're talking too long. And so I try to really keep that uh, kind of confined. So that was just some of the techniques I used. You know, I, I was thinking a little bit too, are you familiar with um, George Pelicanos' uh, books featuring yes. Derek Strange and um, I can't remember the yes. other guy, Quinn. He, he does a similar yeah. thing, you know, or uh, really good. I'm a and huge of course, fan of a... Uh... I'm a huge fan of George Pelicanos. Oh my God, great, such a fantastic great writer. writer. And of course, Joe Lansdale, who you probably know, uh, big hero of everybody. Oh man. Those yeah. Hap and Leonard books are just remarkable books. Um, you those, know, that those were sort of an inspiration for me too. Um, uh, there were a couple of books that I read in the past that kind of gave me the courage to tackle Razorblade Tears. The Hap and Leonard books, uh, there was a book by uh, a, a friend of mine named Todd Robinson called Rough Trade, uh, books that really talked about the, the way we deal with uh, masculinity and prejudice in a hyper-masculine society. But uh, yeah, those were Joe Lansdale. Gosh, man, that dude. He's just the nicest person. I've met him. I had the privilege of meeting him a couple of years ago. And he is just one of our great, great storytellers. Isn't he? I know. He's just like, you know, you want to say he's like our Mark Twain, you know? Uh, yes. I, I really, yes. I really yes. think he I is, totally agree. You know? Yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah. Let's, let's, let's get into a little deeper, deeper dig on some of the characters. Um, did you start mm -hmm. the story with, what did you start with? Did you start with Ike? Or did you start with? Uh, <laughs> so I'll tell things? you. <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story. The way I actually started was the inspiration for these two older men uh, uh, kind of taking on some uh, new age uh, outlaws was uh, a conversation I had with a friend of mine. And we were talking about, I don't know if you're familiar with the actors. Uh, there's an actor named Ron Perlman. Sure. Uh, and there's an actor named Danny Trejo. And oh, yeah. there was a, a publicity still. There was a publicity still when uh, they both were on a show called Sons of Anarchy. And a friend of mine and I were having a conversation and, and he said, you know what? I'd love to have somebody tell a story about these guys, you know, guys of a certain age who have been through the wars, you know, metaphorically speaking, and something comes along and, and, and forces them to confront the, the sins of their past. And that was really something, uh, you know, I think um, as we get older, I think that was something that really stuck with me. I mean, I'm not, I wouldn't consider myself ancient, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not a no spring chicken. I'll be 40, uh, I'll be 48 on my birthday. And, um, you know, I, I'm at a place where I, I finally get the uh, Bruce Springsteen song, Glory Days. I get what it means now, you know, and, and it hits you like a hammer, man. And, uh, and so uh, I wanted to talk about that, 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 you know, people of a certain age, men of a certain age, and, you know, maybe somebody you realize you have more uh, yesterdays than tomorrow. And yeah. what, is your, what is your mark? What do you leave behind? And so that was one part of it. And so that's where, you know, initially I was going to just write uh, a short story about uh, this, this kind of white redneck dude and this Hispanic guy. And then when I decided to expand it into a book, I switched the uh, Hispanic character to an African-American character. And then I just set it in the South. I set it in my, uh, you know, fictional setting for my stories. And it kind of just breathed its own life uh, from there. It, it, I really, I connected I connected with the, the philosophical plight of these characters. You know, I, I, yeah. I don't defend them for their viewpoints in the beginning of the book, and I don't identify with them at all, but I, 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 am, I am empathetic to the fact that, they are, that 
they're trying to change. It's unfortunate that it took a death to get them to change, but they're trying. And so uh, I kind of just fell in love with writing about the story. I love stories about change and trans transformation. And so that was that was definitely the beginning of the book. You know, um, for you know, for the the people watching, um, I mean, we, uh, Sean gave the basic setup of the book. You know which is these two, these two guys, one black, one white, uh, both fathers. They both have gay sons uh, who have, you know, uh, who have gotten their shit together and have a really good example of a family that they've made together, by the way. We haven't really talked about that yet. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. They have a, a young daughter named Ariana. Yeah. And, um, uh, yeah. but, but what I wanted to talk about too is that you know, Ike's wife, Maya, who I wrote down in my little notes, the hidden hero of this book, you know, Maya. Yeah. Um, yeah. I really, yeah. Love, I really love that character. And, uh, you know, she, she's the, uh, she's the she Greek. Did the, did the heavy lifting for Ike while he was inside. And um, can you talk a little yeah, bit about really. her? Is your wife, how, is she the inspiration in some ways? <laughs> Uh, I think uh, I've been blessed to have a lot of women like Maya in my life. Uh, growing up in the South, growing up in a in a you know relatively poor environment, I was blessed to have a lot of strong women around me who did not let the men around me get away with their BS. You know, they called them out on it. You know, my mother was like that. My aunts are like that. You know, and uh, Maya is the person that basically, like you said, holds the story together because she uh, forces Ike to grapple with the, his treatment of his son. And then later in the story, she forces them, both Buddy Lee and Ike, to realize that there are consequences to this action. You know, and, and, and even though she may have tacitly agreed with them beginning this, 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 this plan, uh, she also makes them realize this is what you get because you wouldn't love your sons. This is what you get Right. Because you're doing this for you, you know, don't, don't make this about them. You know, you're all doing this for yourselves. And so she calls them on that. But at the same time, she's human. I didn't want her to be, my friend Kelly Garrett has a great phrase about this and I cannot think of it. So Kelly, if you watch it, please forgive me. But I didn't want her to be a study in stoicism. You know, I didn't want her to be the uh, iron chain type character because she has a moment in the book where she breaks down and she makes a, unwise decision but if you know who she is and you know what she's been through i think everybody would make that same decision you know and uh you know and and i think but she also like i said she doesn't let them get away with any of their bs any of their macho uh bull crap um but i did want to touch on something you said um you know the life of i that isaiah and his husband derek have built is really beautiful and it, you know unfortunately because of the nature of the book we only get to see snippets of it. Right. And those are some of the hardest parts for me to write because they are so happy. You know, they've had this daughter through a surrogate. They paid off their house or their uh, townhouse in Richmond, Virginia. They're, you know, Isaiah's a, a, a journalist and Derek's a pastry chef. And they're just living this really, you know, upbeat, modern, progressive, uh, I would say hipster, but just this really fun <laughs> life. They're enjoying themselves. They're enjoying each other. You know, and they love each other and do, you know, some things that, uh, you know, I can't go spoilers, but some things that happen, they're brutally killed, you know, and, and, and for something that, uh, you know, it doesn't, it just doesn't, you know, that's why I think I can, but at least feel like they have to, you know, even the scales, but, you know, that is, unfortunately, like I said, I had to show a lot of that through flashbacks and bits and pieces, but those pieces were hard to write because, you know, it's hard to take somebody who's, it takes take a scene of joy and happiness and love and just shatter it, um, you know. And and you know, as a writer, though, that's your job. You got to tell the truth. And ugly ugly things sometimes happen to good people, and that's just a horrible fact of life. Right. I should also say um, I have a tendency to dominate these conversations, people. So I apologize. But if you have questions, please go ahead and continue to put them in, and I will. Oh oh man, our our friend Brian Panowich, terrific terrific writer is in the house that's awesome love brian's work brian <laughs> what a great writer uh 
He's a wonderful. So anyway, writer. put your questions in there, and I'll I'll be happy to ask some of them. Um, but what I was going to ask you too, okay, these two men, this is a journey that they're on together, um, very antagonistic at first. Um, did you find yourself, um, uh, you know, Buddy Lee at first is presented to the reader as not a very sympathetic character, you know, um, you mm -hmm. know, he's, he's mm -hmm. just alcoholic, you know, just, uh, you know, kind of an asshole, you know, in a lot of ways. Did you find yourself yeah. becoming more yeah. and more sympathetic to him and and liking him despite yourself during the writing process? Buddy Buddy Lee is a charming character in spite of himself. You know, he's that character that I, I firmly believe. This outside of the uh, just the writing, but my own personal belief, I believe everyone has a chance at redemption. And as the story goes on, and Buddy Lee actually reckons with what redemption looks like, the more he reckoned with that, the more I liked it. So by the end, he's like, you know, he's, he's a good character. He's a good friend. I can him become friends because they both force themselves to be honest. But yeah, in the beginning, you know, he's like a lot of, um, how can I put this? In the beginning, he's like a lot of narrow-minded people that I've encountered in my life who don't bother to think or empathize with people who don't look like them. And so as the story goes on, as he and Ike are challenged about their homophobia, Buddy Lee is challenged about his race, uh, racism. And I should say, I want to say his racism. And so toward the end of the book, there's a scene where uh, Ike and Buddy Lee, because this is a mystery. And so they're tracking down leads and trying to find people. There's a scene where they're in a, a, a very uh, a heavily, um, uh, uh, how can I put this? A very, uh, let's say a, 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 a hyper conservative part of town. And, uh, they come across the house and um, Buddy Lee volunteers to go knock on the door because the house has a Confederate flag posted um, on it. And he does that because he recognizes finally, like, yeah, they're, those kind of people are not going to talk to Ike. I used to be those kind of people and I know what the way they think. And so that scene for me was really when I, you know, I fell in love with Buddy Lee then because he's like, yeah, let me do this because I know these people and they're crazy. And, you know, and I used to be those kind of people. And, and Ike has a scene later on like that uh, in far as to respect to his personal homophobia and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, characters like Buddy Lee are fun to write. They're fun to write because uh, they, you know, they go on interesting journeys, just like Ike is a fun character. I didn't really like Ike in the beginning. Ike could be kind of, like I said, he's uh, uh, very narrow-minded and, and sort of that social conservatism that's uh, prevalent in a lot of rural uh, African-American communities, not not political conservative, but, you know, the 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 church in all its uh, guises is very uh, important and very big part of African-American communities. But sometimes the church can foster a sense of narrow mindedness and, and exclusion. And I think Ike is representative of that in my mind. And so he has to change and move forward. But yeah, Buddy Lee, you know, Buddy Lee gets the best one liners. Ike gets the best threats. And so I kind of gave them both from some, some good spots. So. <laughs> yeah, and we're not giving away any spoilers here, but um, you know, so I'm sure you've caught the gist here that the cops aren't aren't knocking any doors down, or so it seems, to uh, investigate these two right. two sons' deaths. And so um, our two fathers, you know, go off on a on a kind of a classic revenge, vengeance sort of yeah, search, you know, and, and they become detectives in a way. And there's a lot of the classic mm -hmm. buddy detective riffs that are in here that are a lot of fun. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, what was I going to ask you? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, the, another character that's kind of a minor character, but in my mind, a major character is, uh, is Margot. Uh, what a great, yeah. what a wonderful <laughs> character. Yeah, in this- uh, I love Margot, man. I love Margot. <laughs> she's a survivor. She's a tough, tough, uh, she's a tough old bird, man. And you know, it's funny. I, I did, I, I was, I didn't give in to the. At first, I had an urge to make something happen, uh, in a more definite way between Buddy Lee and Margot. But I thought it was good to show them having a friendship that, if circumstances have been different, might become something else. But for Buddy Lee, she sort of serves the same purpose that Maya does. 
not so much on an intimate level, but the fact that she calls him out on his BS. But she's also one of the few people that actually worries about Buddy Lee. She wants him to look out for himself. He, you know, in her very uh, rough-hewn way, she knows he does. He's not looking good. He's not eating right, and and so she's trying to get him to you know t- take stock of himself. And their friendship is, you know, she, they only have a few scenes together, but their friendship, I think, I hope, it seems to me very genuine. They have a lot of great chemistry in their in those scenes together because these are two people who have seen the rough end of the of the stick, and where Buddy Lee is kind of giving in, Margot is, you know, holding on. You know, she's holding on to the spite that sustains her, um, and she's, you know just steady going on and and she was inspired by some uh some friends of mine some people i knew uh who had lived that kind of life and who just are so like you said survivors man they're gonna make it you know regardless if you know if, if a storm comes down and knocks down their apple tree they're gonna make applesauce they're just gonna make it and uh yeah. you know I, I thought she was an interesting character and i i love um i love her final scene i think it's uh yeah well it's uh it, it's emblematic of her character and yeah. and who she is and her relationship with uh with buddy lee Absolutely. And we can't talk about that. <laughs> but yeah, the, I can't I can't talk about that. Final yeah, but, scene, uh, the she, final she, scene is so beautifully done um, on so many levels. Oh man, thank you um, so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, but you no, know, with Margot, I mean there's such an incredible amount of tenderness in those few scenes between the two of them. Uh, you know, just thinking about it now, I think mm-hmm. you're I think you're spot on right, you know, that if you had made them a, a romantic unit. It might not, they might not have been as powerful, you know? No, Somehow. you know, they're, they're neighbors and they're, yeah, I, I wanted to, I just, you know, I think there's this, this idea, how can I put this? There's an idea with some people that men and women can't be friends, you know? There's this whole, quote unquote, you know, friend zone, which I don't, it's not a thing. So if you're either a friend or you're not. But my thing has always been, if I wanted to be intimate with someone or romantic with someone, I'd like to be friends with them first. Because the friendship, is the thing that you build upon. And so them being friends, is just kind of sweet to me. I, I want, you know, this is a very heavy book as we alluded to, and there's a lot of darkness in this book. And there's a lot of times where people are getting hurt and there's a lot of pain. And so these scenes with Margot and Buddy Lee aren't so much comic relief as just, a, 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 like I said, a little bit of, um, you know, sweet tea on a, on, a, on a, you know, summer afternoon, something that just kind of <laughs> smooth things out just a little bit and i i really enjoy it uh i really enjoy showing that you know and uh buddy league is a couple of scenes where he's able to uh show his softer side um you know there's a scene with his ex-wife uh yep. and uh you know he's he's you know being honest about their uh relationship there's a scene in the beginning where he's looking at a an old uh polaroid that he keeps in his wallet of uh of him and um and his son Derek when Derek was a little boy and, you know, he, he can see how he's aged and everything. And, you know, those scenes, you know, they cut away his humor that he uses as a defense mechanism. And you see a really, really broken, but ultimately good man on, underneath all of that. Right, right. And another, another uh, really what I thought was a crucial scene in the book was when they both go into the, uh, into the gay bar and they're having a, Mm-hmm. Ike has this really what I thought was important conversation with the bartender, you know, about mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. forcing to, you know, to kind of see the yeah. prejudice. Yeah. Um, but um, no, yeah. um, go, go ahead. I, I, I just, that scene was really important to me because I really wanted to have or start a conversation in my book. Um, this is a conversation that happened before, but this is the first time I've talked about it. Uh, I wanted to start a conversation about, you know, the intersection of civil rights for people of color and civil rights for LGBTQ members, you know, and and uh, and, and how those those struggles are very similar, if not not identical, but extremely similar. And you know, where I come from, the way I was raised, until everybody's free, nobody's free. And so, uh, you know, that that idea that Ike has, it's not prevalent in the African American community, but it exists. It exists, this idea where like your struggle isn't as bad as our struggle. And I, I stand by the idea that nobody has a monopoly on misery. We've all suffered. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, that bartender, again, calls him out on, on what he sees as his BS, you know, that, yeah, you know, your struggle is legitimate. He's, I could never understand what you're going through, but you'll never understand what I'm going through, you know? 
Yeah. That don't presume and think that what I'm going through isn't as hard as what you've gone through. We don't know. And so we have to be honest about that. And, it, it, you know, Ike doesn't get it right then, but some things happen later and he gets it at a later, at a later point. But also I think that's, that scene is really good to show, uh, give another uh, 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 showcase to these individual characters and, and what are their motivations and their specific character traits. Like with Buddy Lee, when they go in and he realizes it's a gay bar, he doesn't care. It's like, well, they got liquor, you know, they got some Jack Daniels, so I'll be all right. And uh, he <laughs> moves on and moses on and asks some questions. Ike can't calm down. He can't let go of his anxiety long enough to really, he almost actually uh, blows an opportunity to get some really good info on the case that they're trying to solve because he can't let go of his, his homophobia, his prejudice. And so it really does show the, the journey that both of these guys are on. Um, and also, I one more thing I want to say about that scene. Uh, I have a really good friend who's also a fantastic writer uh, named PJ Vernon. And uh, he wrote the uh, book Bathhouse, which is anybody is listening, Bathhouse, remarkable thriller, uh, terrifying uh, thriller. Uh, it's, <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, I let him uh, beta read uh, uh, Raised Blade Tears. And in the original version of that scene, uh, Ike, okay, there's part, part in that scene where Ike gets hit on uh, by a patron of the bar and he freaks out and he starts a fight. And in the original version of that scene, I had all the patrons kind of just stand off to the side and look at Ike, you know, kind of in disappointment and in reproachment. And me as the writer thought, yeah, I want to I want to hammer home that Ike is coming to these, you know, into this space, this safe space and ruined it for the people that uh, inhabit it. And my friend PJ, he said, you know, I think you're a fantastic writer. He said, but uh, let me just one piece of advice. He said, you know, a fight in a gay bar is like a fight in any other bar. Tables get moved, people are yelling, people trying to get their drinks out of the way. He said, you don't have to soften that, uh, you know, because if you soften it, it's not as accurate of a depiction. And I really appreciated that, you know, that's the importance of having authenticity readers or beta readers or whatever you want to call it. Having people, if you're going to write about experiences out of, outside of your personal purview, you do yourself a disservice if you don't have individuals who are living that experience you know read your your work off you know give you some advice give you some pointers give you some notes you know because you want to do the best that you can to give the most accurate portrayal i always say i want to write characters not caricatures ah uh, well put yeah it's funny i put little post-its and stuff and there, there's that scene um where the, the bartender says uh uh he quotes uh Martin Luther King, and he says, you know, yeah, this anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Tex, who's the guy, the bartender, his name. Yeah. And then I kind of like says, ah, oh, man. Um, <laughs> and I love Buddy yeah. Lee. Kind of, he kind of diffuses the whole situation. Says, damn, he dropped yeah. the Martin Luther King card on your ass. I think he won that. Yeah, round. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> love that. That's well, great. and that's Buddy. That's Buddy Lee, man. That's that's him, you know. And and it. Even in him learning and on his journey, by this point, he's sort of warmed up to Ike. I think Buddy Lee warms up to Ike faster than Ike warms up to Buddy Lee. Um, but uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, those two, those two guys, man, they, they go through a lot together. And by the end of the book, they're friends, but I think they've also formed a, a, a familial bond. You know, they've, you know, they've gone through literal wars together. And, uh, you know, um, I, I just, uh, I love their relationship. The book won't, can't work. If their relationship isn't genuine. Yeah. And finally, before I get to these questions, the scene where um, Ike allows himself to see his son's, uh, in his son in Ariana's features, I thought was <laughs> wow. I almost, um, uh, I'll be honest with you, I almost cried right in that scene. Yeah. You know, because it's just, it's just for me, like I guess I don't have any kids, but that sense of passing on, you know, the, the best parts of yourself from one generation to the next is very, I, I, I identify with that. It's very important to me. Um, and so right in that scene was tough because it's like, you know, the finality of what Ike has gone through, you know, it, 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 it can break you, you know, and, and uh, 
You know, ultimately, like I said, Ike is not a bad man. Um, and Buddy Lee isn't a bad man. They've done bad things, you know, but I think there's a distinct difference there. And so um, for all the, um, the the violence and the action and everything, it's ultimately a story also about grief and, and, and how grief, we, we learn to compartmentalize grief and how we learn to try to move on. And, you know, I, I um, the book is dedicated to my mother and, um, my mother uh, passed away while I was I was working on the book, and uh, I'd already written the book. I already had the idea, you know. But then uh, it really it really informed my uh, my editing process and my rewriting process um, because it's um, it's one of those things that you always you're never ready for it and you never get over it. You just learn to live with it, you know. And so. Uh, that definitely is, is is in the book, and that definitely is influenced by my own personal uh, uh, experience. Well, deep deepest sympathies for your loss, also for your your uncle who passed away. Thank you, man. Yeah. Let me yeah. Get to some thank of these, you so much. You bet. Let me get to uh, let me get to some of these questions here. Um, All let's right. Let's see here. Yeah. I'll start with uh, I'll start with uh, Brian Panowich. Um, he says I'm pretty quick to a tear. And reading the tragedy of uh, Isaiah and Derek was gut wrenching. What scenes broke you to write, making you step away and cry it out? Oh man, um, the scene at the very beginning of the book where Ike and Buddy Lee go to uh, Isaiah and Derek's house, and they see the story of their love through the pictures on the refrigerator and, and on the wall, and there's that picture of the three of them of Isaiah, Ariana, and Derek holding like this comically large deed that showed they had paid off the house and yeah that one that broke me that that one i just i, I did i think i stopped writing at two o'clock i didn't come back to like seven o'clock that evening because it was just you know again I, I i unfortunately i think we all know people who have suffered terrible losses who are ultimately really good people and so that that scene broke me and there's a scene and i gotta think of a way to say it there's a scene where um, Ike goes to Derek's job. I mean, Isaiah's job. And he, the people at his job talk about Isaiah and they respect him. And, 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 and that's not an overly dramatic scene, but for me, it was hard because I was like, again, this character, you could have been a part of his life. You could have seen, you know, the admiration of his colleagues, but you couldn't let yourself get past certain things. And so those two scenes were pretty tough. And of course, they, they'd all heard about, about Ike. You yeah, know. yeah, that's the thing too. Yep. Um, let's see. Okay, Pamela says, uh, "I was so excited to see you make uh, Jimmy Fallon's shortlist." Um, <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, the multiple mentions should get you a deluge of readers. I hope so. Man. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, that was fun. I mean, we didn't win, but it was still. Again, as a writer, you can't you can't ask for anything else to have your book on the tonight show desk i mean it's just you know like i said it's just amazing that's the funny thing people ask me a lot like how has life changed between the publication of blacktop wasteland and the publication of raised beach years and uh for a lot of ways it hasn't changed that much you know i still live in the same house I, you know i still write uh i still help out uh with my family and my friends but in other ways it's changed fundamentally you know um i've been able to see my writing like, okay, for instance, Black Top Wasteland is, been, is going to be or has been published in like, I think it's like 11 or 12 countries now. Uh, you know, people all the world are going to read it in their native tongue. And that's just mind boggling. You know, um, Raised by Tears was debuted at number 10 on the New York Times bestseller list. And, you know, that's something that as a kid growing up in Matthews, Virginia, you know, in a double wide uh, with my mama or when we lived in a farmhouse with my grandparents, I couldn't dream that big, you know? I, and so uh, for those things, those are fundamental things, you know? Uh, you know, that's one of the things, I'm gonna work that in every conversation, you know? It's like, nice to meet you. I don't know if you know, I was on the New York Times bestseller list once, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just those things that, you know, you can't conceive of how monumental those things are for a person who comes from the place I come from and the background I come from, you know? And 
I say this a lot, and I don't mean to be, you know, like a Horatio Alger story, but, you know, I come from a really poor childhood. Uh, you know, I dropped out of college. I don't have an MFA. I just wanted to tell stories, you know, and I think ultimately that's the thing, you know, I just wanted to tell stories, you know. Did your mom, uh, your mom saw uh, publication of Black Talk? Yeah. Uh, she saw publication of Blacktop, and I actually won. Uh, I won yeah. uh, the LA uh, the LA Circle uh, book the LA Times uh, book award for mystery um, before she passed. So I was able to go to the hospital and see her, and I, I told her, I said, "Hey, you know, um, I won this award, and, and uh, the, the book's going to be in the LA Times." And uh, she <laughs> she was a character, man. And so she's like, so she like beckoned for me to come closer. I'm like, "What's wrong?" And she said, are they paying you for it? I'm like, yeah, but that's not the point, mom. It's like, you know, there's this award that Walter Mosley has won. And, and, and I said, you know, and Robert Craze has won. And I've won it too. She said, that's nice. Make sure they pay you. And so, you know, she was able to see, um, you know, she was able to see her, uh, as she used to call me, her, uh, her big spirited son do, uh, do a little something. And that's one of my great joys that she that's, was able to see some of that. That's so awesome. Um, let's see. Yeah, I got some other questions here. Uh, Christina um, has two questions. She says, Sean, who is your favorite character and why? And then uh, which character was the most difficult to write and why? Uh, my favorite character, I think, is still always going to be uh, Bug from Black Tide Wasteland. Um, just because I put so much into that character, you know, um, there's a story. I, I think it's apocryphal now, but there's a story about Bruce Springsteen when he wrote Born to Run, and he tells people how he just put everything into Born to Run. Like, this was his last shot, you know, that he felt like, if this doesn't hit, I'm not going to make it a, as a musician. I kind of felt like that with Blacktop Wasteland. I felt like, you know, I've been writing for a long time. I've been writing since back when you had to uh, send self draft snap envelopes to get your story back. You know, I'm an old dog at this. And I kind of felt that way. I'd written a crime novel that was okay. And I felt like, it's, it's weird. When I started Blacktop Wasteland, I didn't have a, a deal. I didn't have a, a contract, but there was a, I felt like there was a, like almost like a, a cloak of seriousness that fell over me. Like, this is it. This is the one. If you don't make it with this, it's not gonna happen. And that was before I met my agent, before I got with Flatiron. I just felt like I'm going to pour everything I have, every ounce of storytelling ability that I have, I'm going to put in this book and this character. And then I've, I, you know, if it doesn't make it, I knew I did everything I could. And so Bug will probably always be my favorite character. Um, the most difficult character to write, um, I can't say, no, I take that back. I take it back. I will say, I wrote a short story that got published uh, by on, a great online crime magazine called Tough. Uh, 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 tough. It's called tough crime fiction, and I wrote a story called Sugar. And the narrator of that story is probably the hardest character I've ever had to write. Um, you know, and, and to give you a hint about that story, it's very, uh, it's very Cain and Abel. But uh, so I hope that answers the question. Sorry to ramble. I... <laughs> Not at all. Um, well, I think a lot of people are asking the question: Are we going to see Bug again? I think so. Um, I have something that I'm working on right now that's a standalone, so it's not a continuation of Blacktop or a continuation of Razorblade. Uh, but after I do that standalone, I, I'd like to revisit uh, the Montage family and, and see where they are. Uh, I, I, uh, I think there is still a story to be told there. Uh, I'd love to see them 10 years from when the book is set. So the book is set in 2012. So we could see them in 2022 and, and maybe we could find out if um, if Bug and uh, Kia got back together, and and you know what does uh what does Javon look like at 22 instead of 12, and what does uh what does Darren look like at 18 instead of eight, and uh you know where are they at? What are they doing? You know, and right. did he really crush the duster? That's a I get that I get asked that a lot. People are like, did he sure. really crush the duster? Is the duster really gone? And so <laughs> and so uh yeah I I think I I have a I, well I'll be honest I have a plot for a follow-up in my head so sweet you know it's funny i think we talked about this last year um 
when I was growing up, my parents had a, had a duster, but it was, it wasn't the, uh, it wasn't like the muscle car version <laughs> of the duster. I think there were two versions. Yeah. Yeah. See, there were two, like the, yeah. It was cool though. It was, you could, it was, uh, you it could was get green. the basic. Yeah. The basic, basic duster. Mm -hmm. Those are going for yeah. a fucking fortune now, aren't they, man? Those dusters. Oh, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. I'll tell you this. This is funny. So this is my only, this is the only time I flirted with indulgence after some of the incredible, you know, very unsurprising success of the book. So I sold the movie rights to Raised Blade Tears, right? And uh, I sold them to uh, Paramount Players in conjunction with Jerry Bruckheimer. So wow. once that went through, I kind of looked up some stuff online. I said, you know, I, I, maybe I'd like to buy a duster, you know? Maybe I'll, I'll do that, either buy one that's fully remodeled, uh, refurbished, or maybe I'll have a project car because I still like to mess around with yeah. engines and stuff. I don't really have the time, but you know, maybe I could rent a garage or something or rent some workspace and, and refurbish one. Yeah, they are way more expensive than I thought. <laughs> what, what I looked at a couple online, I'm like, Oh man, I saw one that was just like the one in the book. It was red. It was a '71 with the turbo uh, uh, option. It had uh, it had the uh, uh, five-speed transmission, the Mopar five-speed. And um, man, that thing they wanted like sixty-five grand for that thing. Wow. Um, I mean, the guy did work on it. I mean, it heck, you know, you you open up the uh, you open up the hood, and it was like looking in the uh, Ark of the Covenant. It was so chromed out. But uh, I yeah, I talked to the boss and. Uh, that that wasn't gonna happen, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah it, I would. <laughs> it'd be cool to find an old one and, and fix it up, you know, as you say. Yeah, ours, ours I would was love to do that. Oh my god, ours was green. It was a cool color. It was like a, a metallic green with the white stripe, and it had uh, the white mm -hmm. vinyl, mm -hmm. white vinyl interior, which apparently, as a little boy, I puked in I the back that. of. But uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, Let's see here. Okay, yeah, Sharon, Sharon Jordan. She says, uh, "Please ask Sean about his writing process." Yeah, how how do you how do you get it done? Okay. All right. So for me, I started out writing short stories. Uh, that was my bread and butter for a long time. Um, and so I uh, I was a big uh, devotee of uh, uh, White and Strunk's Elements of Style. Uh, mm -hmm. And so uh, for me, writing short stories was always just get in, get out, you know, set it up, so, you know, uh, set up the conflict and then end it. When I started writing novels, I tried outlining, but I'm, I'm not, I'm just not, a, I'm just not somebody who's, who uh, brain works that way. Uh, I, I know some people that outline that are remarkable novelists and they make remarkable outlines. I, I can't do it. So for me, like when I come up with a, an idea that really sticks with me, I will write a very long two, three, maybe four page synopsis of the story. And it's very much like a just stream of consciousness. I just sit down and I open up a Google doc and I'm like, okay, here's this guy. He used to be a getaway driver. And I'll just, I'll write the whole story out in, in, a, like, uh, in a treatment. And uh, once I do that, then I'll go back and I'll look at plot holes and, and things that don't work. I'm like, all right, well, that doesn't make any sense. I got to change that or whatever. Uh, but for me, I've got to see a possible ending before I start the book. Now, a lot of times the ending doesn't match, the ending in the book doesn't match the ending in the synopsis, but I have to be in a mental space where I can do that. Now, um, as far as when I get started with a novel, one of the things I do is I write, uh, I try to write two to four chapters at a time. Uh, I don't edit as I go, but I will read over it a lot. I'll, I'll maybe uh, send pieces out to friends. I'll send a chapter here, a chapter there to see if I'm getting the tone right. Uh, and, and I'll tell my friend, hey, uh, I have a good friend named Nikki Dolson, who's a fantastic writer. And uh, poor thing, I've, I've, <laughs> I've hammered her with stuff like this over the years. I'll send her something like, hey, I'm trying to really get a sort of, you know, hella high water meets justified tone here. Do you think I got it? And then she'll say, oh, yeah, you definitely did. Or no, it doesn't really feel that way to me. And then I'll keep on writing and I'll keep on writing. And it usually takes me about nine months to do a first draft of a novel. We're talking about 80,000 words. And, uh, and then uh, I, uh, I hate, I hate uh, rewriting. I, I don't do a lot of rewrites. I, I try to nail it as much as I can in the beginning. And then I get my editor to look at it. And then she puts her notes to it. 
and then I fixed the problem that she had. And uh, for anybody that's listening, um, I'm very lucky to have a great editor at Flatiron named Christine uh, Kapachik. And a great editor knows when to challenge you and also knows when to push you. And those are two different things. You know, a great editor will challenge you when the story really isn't working and you could do, you could do better, but also they'll push you to t- take risks when you play it and safe. And I've been blessed with that. So that's sort of my process. Flatiron's a great house. I really, I really like what they're doing. Wow. Yeah. You also have a great, great pub- they've been great to me. They're, you have a great publicist too, Sally Ann McCartan, our good friend. Yeah. She's the best. I got a great, I got a great team. Sally, Sally Ann is great. My agent, Josh Getchler of, of HG Literary is the, for my money, he's the best agent in the business. He changed my life. He literally changed my life. I, you know, a, a chance meeting at a book convention, you know, he's just, the guy gets it and he, 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 he gets his writers and he gets as much as he can for you. And that's, that's all you can ask. So. Yeah. Well, let's see here. Um, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Somebody was asking, uh, Sean, weren't you writing a novel called, and I just lost it. Shoot. Oh, black as sackcloth. Is that the name of your <laughs> progress? Or? Yeah. Well, I had to change the name because, uh, 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 I can't get into it. There's a whole thing with that. I changed the name. So the new name of the novel in progress is All the Sinners Bleed. And so that's the one I'm working on now. I'll give a real quick, uh, I'll give you a real quick uh, elevator pitch about that. So All the Sinners Bleed takes place in Southeastern Virginia. Surprise, surprise. Uh, uh, and it's about uh, the first black sheriff of a small Southern town. And on the one year anniversary of his election, there's a shooting at the local high school and a beloved uh, high school teacher is killed. And his assailant sort of commits suicide by cop, but it's also sort of a bad shoot. Uh, but before uh, our sheriff, uh, Titus, who's our sheriff, before he can investigate that, he uh, finds out that the high school teacher was involved uh, in some horrific crimes. Uh, he was uh, part of a serial, serial killer trio. Uh, so he, the shooter, and a third mystery person uh, have been kidnapping and murdering kids for like 10 years. And so Titus finds out that his small town, his hometown, has been dumping ground for a serial killer. And so he's determined to find this third person, uh, much to the chagrin of the town council and the town elders who just want to forget this ever happened. And so he's searching for that person while at the same time dealing with you know, the difficulties of being an African-American police officer in 2017, uh, and also dealing with uh, a burgeoning far right group who wants to stage a uh, a very confrontational, like uh, unite the right uh, 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 parade in his hometown. Um, so that's the book I'm working on now called All the Sinners Bleed. So it's talking about you know it's a lot of my southern fiction tropes that I love. It's, it's race, class, sex, religion, uh, identity. Uh, uh, and all of that uh, kind of swirling together. Um, for anybody that read Razor Blade Tears, it's going to be dark, but not as bloody. I think there's going to be more offstage violence. Uh, than I, I'm going for a different atmosphere with this. I want to kind of evoke, um, I want to evoke that uh, True Detective season one meets Faulkner and, 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 o- and Flannery O'Connor kind of feel. So uh, that's what I'm working on right now. So I'm hard at work on that. That sounds amazing. Um, can you talk a little bit? I'm just looking to see if there are any more questions. But can you talk a little bit about about your uh, about your influences? I'm assuming that you kind of draw from all over the. Oh place. man. Oh my God, I'm I'm influenced by. I mean, I re- I used I still read everything, but when I grew up, um, you know, we didn't have a lot of money, so I didn't get to go bookstores a lot. So I ended up a lot of times at the library. I used to ride my bike down to the library, which was a haunt. I couldn't do it now. Uh, oh, for the vigor of youth. Uh, but uh, I used to ride my bike to the library. Uh, we would go to, uh, uh, we call them thrift stores or secondhand stores. So I would always just grab paperback. I love to read. And so my influences go all the way from Raymond Chandler and Ross and John McDonald and, and Mike uh, 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 and Mickey Spillane uh, to Chester Himes to Donald Goins to a lot of non-crime writers. 
like uh, Jane Smiley is one of my favorite writers. Uh, I was a huge fan of English mystery. So I read a lot of Agatha, Christ Agatha Christie and Dorothy L. Sayers and P.D. James. Uh, but also I love, love, love early American uh, fiction. So I'm a big Jack London fan. Uh, Thomas, uh, I love that the early, uh, you know, uh, uh, 1800s, uh, late modern 19th century fiction. So Thomas Hardy, uh, Frank Norris, stuff like that. Amer Theodore Dreiser and American Tragedy. Uh, stuff like, books like that were a big part of my uh, upbringing. I, I do, if you had to ask me, I consider myself like a naturalistic Southern Gothic writer. Uh, I'm much more a part of the naturalistic school of, uh, of, of thought. Uh, so like I said, I mentioned some of those folks, um, but also I, I pull from a very deep well of African-American writers. I've mentioned Donald Goins and Chester Hines, Walter Mosley, Zora Neale Hurston, uh, Ernest J. Gaines, uh, uh, Alice Walker, uh, you know, Nikki Giovanni, um, those great, great Af Langston Hughes, County Cullen, Paul Dunbar. I mean, just those great writers of the Harlem. The Harlem Renaissance is one of those moments in time that I wish I could go back to. I just love to be a fly on the wall, you know, on 125th Street when, you know, Zora Neale Hurston is dancing and Dizzy Gillespie's playing or I'm not Dizzy, Louis Armstrong's playing and, and Langston Hughes is drinking a martini. Just so, yeah, I have a wider range of, of, of influence, but also, you know, the traditional Southern Gothic uh, writers as well. I mentioned Faulkner and O'Connor, but uh, Yudura Welty. I think I mentioned William Gay earlier, Charles Wolford, Harry Cruz. Uh, writers oh, wow. like that. Uh, one of my modern influences, um, and I've only read, he's, I think he's only written two books in a collection, but one of my, my, one of the people that have influenced me the most outside of just straight crime writing is uh, Donald Ray Pollock. The Devil yeah. All the Time is the, is the best Southern Gothic novel not written in the South. <laughs> uh, it's just, it's, it, he is just, there's something in the way that he captures not the banality of evil, but just the banality of existence, of moving from one place to another in your life and how things conspire to knock you about, you know, uh, 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 you know, sinners in the hands of an angry God, to quote Jonathan Edwards. And uh, I love that book. I've reread it multiple times. I love his writing. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's just a few of uh, the folks that have influenced me a lot. Not, uh, he wrote Knock Em Stiff, right? Knock him stiff, the devil all the time. And he wrote a collection that I can't think of the name of right now. And I'm killing myself because I love that too. But yeah, he's like I said, and then like I said, you know, he's great. Uh, Dennis Lehane, I, I mentioned Walter Mosley, Elmore Leonard. Uh, those are my uh, three people on my uh, Mount Rushmore of crime writing. Dennis Lehane and Elmore Leonard write the best pure dialogue I've ever read in my opinion. Mm. The way they have people talk to each other. Uh, you know, a lot of people talk about George V. Higgins, and which he's great. I, I, no disparagement of, you know, the Friends of Eddie Coyle is a classic. Yeah. Um, but there's something in the way that Leonard wrote dialogue. It made you feel like you were eavesdropping on a conversation. That, that black humor uh, that, he, that he had. I mean, nobody yes. like that, you know. Yeah. Oh, man. No, not at all. I, I, I love it. Love it. <laughs> love, uh, love Williford too. I mean, Williford was a, just a singular thinker and talent, you know, and yeah. Yeah. So many great. And I like that you mentioned people like uh, Frank Norris, you know, like, wasn't he the one that wrote the octopus? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, McTeague and all those. Yeah. The octopus. Yep. Yeah. McTeague. McTeague. I did my, uh, before I dropped out, I did one of my college dis dissertation on McTeague. You know, and McTeague is a great book because it's not ostensibly a book about an evil person. He was, a but it's a book right? about a person, a dentist, and yeah. he had this poor girl who was way younger than him, and he took advantage of her. And um, but it's McTeague is not a book about a person who's ostensibly just evil, but it's about a person who's not good. And there's a big distinction there. And Frank huh. Norris did that in a way that's it's 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 it makes you shiver because a lot of people are not evil. They're just not good. And so anyway, I could talk about that stuff forever. <laughs> that's, that's, that's very interesting. Yeah, you could talk about that. Wow. Well, we haven't even really, and I know we <laughs> need to take this in for a soft landing here, but um, uh, we haven't talked about the bike, the biker gang in, in, the, in the Razor Blade Tears, uh, the rare breed. Yeah, and, um, the rare the, breed. Yeah. You make them bleed for the them. breed. 
<laughs> oh man. So I wanted to have antagonists who were formidable because Ike and Buddy Lee, despite their being a little long in the tooth, they're formidable. You do not want to be on the wrong side of Ike Randolph or Buddy Lee James. And so for me, I wanted to have characters who existed outside the law, who presented, you know, your, your heroes are only as good as your villains, you know? And so for me, uh, you know, Grayson and the rest of the rare breed, they had to be characters who, were, who could, you could conceivably think would maybe get the better of Ike and Buddy Lee. Um, and so uh, I didn't try to make them, I've seen them described as like a skinhead gang. They're not really skinheads, they're just, they're no more racist than any other motorcycle club, you know. Uh, they, you know, but they just live outside the, uh, the bounds of law. They are, um, you know, they are manipulated themselves to a certain extent. Can't give too much away. Um, but uh, yeah, they are, they are a threat. They're a serious threat. The scene in Ike's shop, when they come in the shop, and they underestimate Ike, so they don't bring guns. They bring, you know, uh, they pipes. bring uh, 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 just pool, uh, yes, pipes and bar fight uh, weapons. And, um, you know, that scene was uh, tough to write because it's, it's scary. But it also, I thought, did a great job of showing their formidableness, you know, because, yeah. you know, even after he's been held down on a desk and he's got a wound bleeding on his neck and he's got a gun pointed at him, uh, that that leader, Grayson, you know, he's still, you know, he still has enough uh, cockiness, enough uh, drive uh, to, you know, say, I'll be back, you know, yeah. I'm going to see you soon. And so, uh, you know, they definitely had to be formidable. Um, but I do like the idea of the fact that they're formidable, but because they have the hubris to keep underestimating Ike and Buddy Lee, it does things don't go the way they think. And so, uh, but I thought they made good villains. I don't have anything against motorcycle clubs. I just thought they made good villains and they're interesting characters. And their their ethos and their uh, drive changes over the course of the book. Um, it becomes it goes from business to very personal for them. And I thought that was interesting too. Right on. Well. Um, hey, this has been a really, a really great hour. Uh, thanks so much for, uh, for talking with us tonight. And um, congratulations on all your success, man. Um, here are the two books oh, right man. here. Thank you so yeah. much. I just put, I managed to put the link in the, uh, in the comments field for signed copies. We still have a few left. So if you want one, you know what to do. Um, but uh, any, anything in any parting words as far as authors that you think are people need to check out? Uh, yes. You mentioned Kelly Garrett, who's a terrific yes. writer, has a new book coming. Yeah. Who, else should, who else should we be reading? Yeah, she got a book called, uh, uh, Kelly's got a new book called Like a Sister coming out next year. Um, and I think it's great. I've read a Vance copy. It's magnificent. Um, there's a writer right now that I think is one of the most fearless, fearless writers I've ever encountered. A uh, young woman by the name of Heather Levy. Uh, she has a book called Walking Through Needles, um, an incredibly dark and, and intense journey into uh, the inner uh, the inner agency of a, a, a woman who finds herself drawn back to her hometown to solve a murder and also confront memories of her past. Um, if you like if you like a lighter fare, uh, Gigi Pandian, who is in my mind the modern master of the locker room mystery. She has a new book coming out with a new character. I got to read an advanced copy of that because I'm buddies with a lot of people. Thank you. It's a fantastic. Uh, so Gigi Pandian is somebody people should be reading. Um, I always try to mention these two writers and then I'll let you go because I think both of them are doing remarkable things in different fields. Because I'm also a horror fan. One of the best scary supernatural books, uh, Southern Gothic books that I read recently was The Boatman's Daughter by Andy Davison. Uh, it takes a lot to get under my skin with atmosphere, and, and he did it in spades. Uh, and so Andy Davison, a voice people should be looking out for. And there's a young woman named Yasmin uh, McClinton, who has a book coming out uh, next, uh, later this year called Her Name is Night. And it's such an incredible achievement. It's the amalgamation of espionage uh, and, and pan-African uh, setting, and a uh, female-centric lead. And uh, it's just an incredible achievement. If you liked uh, Red Widow, if you like uh, you know, the Dan Daniel Silver books, 
You'll love her name is Nia Yasmin, is an incredible person, an incredible writer. Uh, so definitely check her out. Uh, and then on a, on a personal note, uh, there's a guy that's a good friend of mine. Uh, he's, a, in, he's with an independent publisher. Um, but um, uh, James D.F. Hanna, he writes a series of detective novels starring a former disgraced uh, state trooper uh, named Henry Malone. Uh, and uh, he is able to take the tropes of the traditional PI novel and really force them through a prism of a modern sensibility, you know? And I just, I love what he does with Henry and what he puts him through both physically and, and emotionally. Uh, so yeah, James D.F. Hanna, some, uh, somebody people should be, he's a former Seamus winner. He, uh, he won the Seamus award last year. Uh, and uh, I just can't say enough nice things about the guy. But uh, I want to thank uh, Poison Pen and thank you personally. And uh, thank everybody at Poison Pen for having me. Hopefully, if people get the act together and we get all our vaccinations in, I'll be able to come out to Arizona and visit you guys in person. I'd love to do it. That would be great. We'd love that. And also, I know yeah. you're busy. I know you're yes, busy sir. as hell now, but I, I, I'm so glad to ask you that final question and hear such a great response. Would you be willing to do like a brief, like guest blog post with some of these recommendations? Oh yeah, e e uh, send me an email and I'll write it up and send it back to you guys. I'd love to That'd do it. That'd be great because I'm getting some questions here. People want to want that list of writers. So, uh, we'll <laughs> yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. Have, just as a definitely. Have you read? Um, I'll just give one. Throw one into the mix here. Um, have you read Richard Lang's new book called Rovers? Um, wonderful writer. No, I've heard of it, but I haven't read it. Yeah, yeah I have to check it out. I haven't read it yet. I'll definitely have to check it out. Yeah, uh, we're going to be yeah, doing. I'll with definitely him. give that a check. Yeah, he's one of the best. All oh, right, man, I'll be checking. I'll be clicking in for that. There you go. All righty, man. Thank you so much, guys. Have a great. Night. Have a good night. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks.